Robert Fritz, your one stop for news, current events, entertainment, and all things relating to the paranormal, the supernatural, the 14, and things that go bump in the night. Hello, Fritz here with you. Tonight we uh, start with three very special stories. This first one from Nick Spry. It's the curse of the Hope Diamond. Check it out. We have a lot to learn from this wolf. I want to hang out with him. You guys actually know anything about the Hope Diamond uh, curse? I know it looks sweet as f around Hans's neck. <laughs> <laughs> Before diamonds were discovered in Brazil in 1720 and then later on in South Africa in the mid to late 19th century, all diamonds came from India. I didn't we've know always that. loved shiny rocks. We will kill, we will murder for shiny rocks. Well, but the Indians didn't quite feel that way. In Indian lore, diamonds are referred to as Vajra, that's V A J R A, or thunderbolts, and they were thought of as sort of a receptacle for powerful energies. They could only be uh, handled and wielded by gods, and that would form the thunder and lightning in the sky. Uh, and in their culture as well, uh, it was kind of looked down upon to cut the diamonds, unless you were removing impurities, because the more weight that the diamond had, the more power that it could absorb, and they never refined them to the point of refracting light. Uh, they always thought that it was more of a, a gemstone to protect and absorb bad energies. It's just a big raw diamond, like just with just crust taken away, just just the. Well, they were cut. They were cut, but okay. they were roughly cut, and they weren't cut into what we think of now as gemstones. Um, and blue diamonds, in particular, were relevant to the god Yama, who was the god of death, uh, but he would also destroy evil. Jean-Baptiste Trevernier, uh, he, in 1666, but there is a authoritarian on the Hope Diamond, his name is Richard Curran, uh, he wrote a great book about it, he works for the Smithsonian Institute, he's probably the foremost authority on the Hope Diamond in the world. Um, he claims that it was in 1653 that he acquired this 112 and 3 16th carat, Damn. roughly cut, blue diamond. Uh, and this was out of the Kolar mine in Golconda, India, which was sort of known as like the El Dorado of India. It was sort of fabled for all of the riches that were there. And once this was discovered, it was brought back to France and sold to Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King. It was sold for around what today would be one point eight million dollars. Well, that's it. That's it. But it, again, in uncut, whatever, rough. Uh, okay. was they, didn't know, they didn't know what they had just yet. So, at the king's behest, it was recut by Sir Pito, uh, the court ruler, in 1673, down to 67 carats. A mere, and a tiny speck of a jewel. It was dubbed the uh, French Blue, which is commonly known as, but also the, in proper French, the Blue Diamond of the Crown. Uh, but it doubled its value because in this era, people were learning to cut glass and to cut gemstones in order to make the most out of refracting light. It's, it's funny because the, the Hope Diamond is so rare, it has a little bit of boron, one molecule of boron to every million molecules of carbon that gives it a deep blue color. How uh, do we figure this shit out? Uh, to, to, <laughs> I mean, it's, that's pretty impressive that we can figure out the many of, n number of molecules per square inch of a gemstone. Through spectrographs right. and things oh, yeah. like that. And, oh, I mean, I know how yeah. to say that when you really... <laughs> oh, I'm aware how of how, sir. I'm just saying when you really step back, it's pretty freaking fascinating, jackass. Please continue. After the sale, though, Trevernier was allegedly mauled to death by feral dogs in Moscow of course in the late he was. 17th of course. century. Yes, he was. Dogs, quote Always. unquote. Yes. And that is the first death attributed to the Hope Diamond curse. The first. So Louis the Fourteenth, he was uh, beleaguered by many health ailments after he had procured this diamond. Uh, especially after he had procured this diamond. He eventually dies in 1715 at the age of 77 from gangrene. But it seems like this gemstone that everyone it comes in association with, even including people that have not worn it, tend to befall to some sort of nefarious end. Uh, even okay, so we've brought this gemstone into a house that kills people. That's a gemstone what I'm that kills saying, people. man. Oh, I'm this freaking is a, out of this. This is not awesome. Good, so it's even good. someone that just barely wore it once, on, on on borrowing it, a, a friend of the king, uh, Nicolas Fouquet, he wears the diamond once, and then shortly thereafter, he is accused of embezzlement, and he is publicly disgraced, and then executed. So Louis the Fourteenth successor, Louis the Fifteenth, is <laughs> didn't see that coming. No. Yeah, yeah, you never expected. Yeah, they got super weird. <laughs> what a though. twist! During his reign, uh, he is awarded a title in the Order of the Golden Fleece, and has the jewel set into his ceremonial ribbon. Uh, piece, which is basically one of the most valuable jewelry settings that has ever been conceived. Um, 
think hundreds of diamonds and at the centerpiece of it on, on the lower half. It's only a six inch ribbon, but hundreds of diamonds and at the bottom half, this oh, rare damn. blue diamond. And the uh, Kanye of the time bought it immediately. This was in 1749. And so then years later, uh, during the French Revolution, this had been uh, the, the jewel had been basically become part of the French crown jewels at this time. So during the French Revolution, uh, in the fall of 1792, the royal family is imprisoned during the reign of terror, quote unquote. Uh, and meanwhile, the French crown jewels, they are under lock and key in the royal storehouse. And during one of the most notorious robberies of all time. So basically, a group of thieves over five nights broke in and out of the royal storehouse, stealing every possession of the royal family. Oh, yeah. And I'm not just talking about jewels. I'm talking about sconces, paintings, clothing, every. They took everything. It was basically no... They took the sconces? They took the sconces. Yes. These people. That's what I'm talking about. These people need their sconces, for God's sakes. But there's even a theory, uh, also according to Richard Kieran, uh, that perhaps the French Revolution was staged in order to commit the robbery of this particular gem. And also, during this time, you have to think about the hit list. Hit list! Louis XVI, King of France, in 1792, went to the guillotine. His wife, Marie Antoinette, went to the guillotine. Princess Marie Louise de Landlau, uh, she was beaten, raped, and literally ripped to pieces by an angry mob. Wow. And she had been known to wear out the Hope Diamond on many occasions. Mm. So after this theft, the diamond disappears. And it's around this time there are some rumors that Catherine the Great briefly possessed the diamond before she died of apoplexy in um, 1796. Oh. Then, in 1812, a 44-carat diamond emerges in London in possession of uh, Daniel Eliasson. And this was bought by George IV, King of England. And it was set into a big sort of a f*** you resemblance of the Order of the Fleece Ribbon to Napoleon, who he had been battling. So it was 44 carats? Yes, it went down from uh, 67 Seven. carats to 44, 45 carats when uh, Louis the 15th had it set into an Order of the Fleece emblem. What'd they do Ooh, with the extra yeah, carats? Somebody the whacked off a big piece of it. And yeah. Yeah. There's actually many, many theories about this, uh, and they have at the Smithsonian pieced it back together that uh, there is three separate stones that have come off of the original... Um, the uh, Infinity Stones. Well, it could be. Could be. <gasps> Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Let's not get that deep in the conjecture. There was one that was owned by Charles of Brunswick, who was a German uh, duke, who had probably the most fantastic diamond collection in the world in the 18th, 19th century. Uh, so there is that one, there is the Hope Diamond, and then there is a much smaller piece that they have all confirmed have come from the original George IV, who possessed a stone. Uh, there's actually a very notable portrait of him in 1822 wearing it on his breast. Um, he dies in financial ruin in 1830, and the executor of his state, the Duke of Wellington, ends off selling the stone on the sly to his good friend uh, that also was friends with George IV, Thomas Hope, uh, a family of great wealth. They actually fronted the money for the Louisiana Purchase to America when it was bought. Nice. Oh. Yes. So a very, very wealthy family of uh, Anglo-Dutch descent. This was done without public knowledge to avoid humiliating the royal lineage. George, he died because he was a terrible alcoholic. He suffered from dropsy, and uh, upon his death, doctors discovered that he had an orange-sized tumor in his bladder, amongst <gasps> other ailments. So Thomas Hope's brother, Henry Philip, he was a diamond collector and aficionado, and so the stone was passed then on to him, and during the next three generations of hopes, the stone eventually gains its name by showing it at World's Fairs, at the London Exposition in the Crystal Palace. Just spreading that evil everywhere. Yes, and then it became known as the Hope Diamond. Like, hope you don't die. Yes. But again, the hit list on this one... da 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 da, -da! So we have, in between the succession of George IV to its next owners, uh, Wilhelm Falls, who supposedly recut the diamond to disguise it. It's stolen by his son, who also murdered him. Then his son, Hedrick Falls, commits suicide. And then Francis Beaulieu, uh, he steals the stone and then dies in abject poverty and misery after that. So, Henry Philip Hope, he has many misfortunes, uh, including the death of his son, and he dies without an heir. Henry's daughter, Henrietta, uh, married into the aristocracy, marrying the Earl of Lincoln. And this then uh, brought onto the stone a family heirloom aspect where it could not be separated from the family name without the court of law.
So, Henrietta's youngest son, Francis, ends up marrying May Yohe, who is an American stage actress from Pennsylvania in the late 19th century. More tragedy strikes in the fact that Francis gambles away the family fortune. Again, he is an earl, he is an aristocrat, and it is estimated that he, in today's monetary value, gambled away between 450 and 600 million dollars. Damn! Yes. But you know he had a good time! (laughs) There's no way he did not have the the best time anyone could ever imagine. What a waste. I know, but still, damn. And he eventually dies alone in poverty. Of course, but with a smile on his face, probably. May ends up running <laughs> off with uh, Putnam Strong, who is the son of former New York City mayor William Strong, and despite her fame, also dies penniless. But before their deaths, the stone was approved for sale in order to save the family legacy in 1901. Uh, the diamond was sold to Joseph Frankel's and Sons, a jewelers in New York City. And using most of the capital for this investment, the firm begins to go into ruin. And the story of a curse now, just now, after all of these hundreds of years, starts to appear in newspapers. And it's mainly purported by the New York Times and the Post. What was the first new sighting or a new, a new report? Excuse me. I know the word hoodoo was used. Hoodoo. <laughs> Who do the voodoo that you do? In between this period, while they owned it, it was shown and sold to... Abdul Hamid in 1908 the uh, via his second Salim Habib. So Habib ends up drowning in the sinking of the French steamer Seine of Singapore in November 1909, and the Sultan is eventually overthrown in the Young Turks Revolution. The stone was also sold before his overthrow uh, to pay off his debts in Paris 1909 for about $80,000, which is now around $2.17 million. Uh, it was sold to Pierre Cartier of uh-huh. oh. Jewelers fame. And in 1910, he started to try to sell this stone, this very famous stone, and employed an old story in order to do so. He was trying to sell it to Ned and Evelyn um, McLean. McLean owned the Washington Post at the time. He was a paper mangate. The story he employed was one of uh, Wilkie Collins, who wrote a story called The Moonstone. And this is back in the late... 19th century. He was friends with Charles Dickens, but it recounts the story of a priestess trying to steal the yellow gem out of the uh, statue of a Hindi god and was forever cursed and trapped. Uh, And then once the stone was recovered, everything went back to normal. But this same story was inspired by none other than Jean-Baptiste Trevernier, the original procurer of the Hope Diamond, who mentioned in one of his uh, journeys this folktale, recounting the same sort of details, and this is where the curse was built off of. The couple knowing this still bought the stone. Evelyn was convinced that things that were bad luck for other people were good luck for her. And then yet, tragedy strikes her family. Shocker! Yeah. In uh, 1919, her son Vincent, uh, while they were attending the Kentucky Derby, was struck by a Model T Ford going about eight miles an hour down the road. He was he was a very young child. Uh, Went to a race horse, got hit by a car. He was concussed and died from complications of the injury. Her daughter, at the age of 25, committed suicide from a drug overdose. Uh, Her husband, Ned, was uh, implicated in the Teapot Dome scandal of Warren G. Harding's presidency. He was the guy that signed the checks. Uh, Lost everything. Went insane and uh, spent the last of his days in an insane asylum in Towson, Maryland, which, coincidentally, is where I was born. Oh, wow. Wow. (laughs) So you got just a little bit of curse on you? Just a little bit of curse. A little little bit of curse on you. Evelyn was very generous with the stone and generous to society, and so nothing really bad besides the other tragedies befell her personally. Nothing, nothing bad other, other than, than the other tragedy. The deaths in her family. Like. Nothing befell her personally. She was not injured or... An, an all around her, her died death. in misery. But upon her death, the entire lot of her gem collection was bought by Harry Winston Incorporated. He was a jeweler. Uh, and he eventually donated it to the Smithsonian Institute in 1958. And oddly enough, he shipped it through registered mail. Really? Yes, he did. <laughs> Just to spread the curse throughout the Americas. Yep. $2.65 postage with yeah, insurance. What was the insurance like oh. on that? Yeah. Yep. yeah. He put it in a brown wrap, uh, brown paper bag wrapped box. And yet even the man that picked up the delivery, he uh, uh, delivered it in November. In February, his wife died. <gasps> his dog died. He was struck by a car and it- broke both his legs and eventually died from complications. Oh my god. So all the way up until the last guy, I was just going to say this seems like a, the the standard like foibles of rich ass, right? Like 
bought this amazing $3 million diamond and then wrecked in a ship, like a steamer off the coast of whatever. <laughs> and, and the Sultan was, like, you know, you know, to fame. Mold by his prize Right, camel. exactly. Right. But the, the mailman That's... thing definitely, like, is like weird for sure that's strange you are listening to fort fritz on real radio 104.1 fort fritz on real radio 104.1 welcome back to fort fritz hello fritz here this one this is a a very cool story an unexplainable death of a handsome gorgeous man this is tom on chewed and the somerset man on fort fritz have you guys ever heard of the tamam shud case (laughs) bless you tamam shud uh, this is possibly one of the f- the f- coolest things that I have read about, and it, it's unfortunate. It's a uh, it's about a dead man. Did you say mystery of Summerland man? Summerton, S O M E R T O N. Summerton man. Summerton, uh, man, because he was found on December first, nineteen forty eight, on Summerton Beach in Glenleg, just south of Adelaide, South Australia. Oh, mate. Tamam Shud, uh, the reference to that comes from the Persian phrase, which is printed on a scrap of paper found months later in the pocket of the man's trousers. The scrap had been torn from the final page of a copy of the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam, authored by 12th century poet Omar Khayyam. Following the public appeal, uh, someone actually came out and uh, was able to locate a copy of this uh, relatively rare book that had a piece of this uh, paper torn out of it. Um, And on the back cover, they were able to start doing some sleuthing and found some indentations, and and it led down this sort of rabbit hole. Um, It's one of the uh, most mysterious, I guess, cold cases in Australia's history and kind of goes uh, in several different directions that you're not expecting. So uh, 1948, 6.30 a.m., the police were contacted about a man dead on Summerton Beach. He was found lying in the sand across from a uh, an orphanage, and uh, a couple of people said that they saw him lying with his back re- uh, resting against a seawall. His legs extended in front of him, and Just his like feet Tim. crossed. Yeah. It was believed that he died while sleeping. An unlit cigarette was on the right collar of his coat. So you can imagine, like, he was just like, uh. Mm-hmm. Uh, a search of his pockets revealed an unused second-class rail ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach, a bus ticket from that city that could not be proved to have been used a narrow aluminum American comb, half a packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, an army club cigarette packet containing seven different cigarettes of different brands, and a quarter full box of Bryant and May matches. Hmm. Uh, They basically said they thought maybe he was a drunk man who fell asleep on the beach, but they realized that something was wrong because uh, apparently the mosquitoes are insane on that beach and he was getting destroyed by them and they figured that there's no, there's no way that guy is alive. He's being, like, <laughs> swarmed. Well, would they would they go after dead animals as well? Like, you I don't would know think how that the, works. If, if the blood isn't being pumped. I guess it was freshly dead, you know, yeah, if it's still at the surface. Hell, I'm sure. But after they but end up looking like grapes on him because they're just enjoying being oh, there. <laughs> uh, pathologist John Burton Cleland uh, said the man was of Britisher appearance and thought to be of age <laughs> around 40 to 45. We all know what he means by that, too. You yep. can see it. You're like, oh, yeah, totally. He was in top physical condition, 180 centimeters, which is about 5'11", uh, tall, with gray eyes and fair to ginger-colored hair. Slightly gray around the temples. Broad shoulders, narrow waists, and hands and nails that showed no signs of manual labor. Big and little toes that met in a wedge shape like those of a dancer or someone who wore boots with pointed sh- huh. with pointed toes. Okay, pronounced, high ca- pronounced high calf muscles like those of a ballet dancer. These can be dormant genetic traits, but they are also characteristics of many long-distance runners and uh, various athletes. They're impressed by this guy. I right? Mean, he kind of sounds hot. Deep like, blue eyes that you get lost in for hours and at just a time. Runner's calves <laughs> that you could just like grate cheese on onto Soft, your salad. Supple skin that you just want to fall asleep on. Uh, <laughs> all labels on the clothes had been removed, and he had no hat, which was apparently unusual for 1948. <laughs> yeah. or, or that a was wallet. like the headline Hatless corpse found. <laughs> Shock horror. <laughs> The body was clean-shaven, carried no identification, which lead police to believe he had committed suicide. His teeth did not match the dental records of any living known person that they had access to. And the coroner, Cleland, remarked that if the body had been carried to its final resting place, then all difficulties would disappear. Which, I guess from his end, the investigation, he would be able to explain it if he could say that it was carried there, but it didn't appear that. 
The autopsy was conducted, and the uh, pathologist estimated the time of death around 2 a.m. on December 1st. There was blood mixed with the food in the stomach. Both the kidneys were congested, and the liver contained a great excess of blood in the vessels. The spleen was strikingly large, about three times the normal size, and there was a destruction in the center of the liver. Autopsy shown that his last meal was a pasty eaten three to four hours before his death, and they could not conduct, uh, they couldn't conclude that it, the pasty contained anything that would have caused this. However, his suicide note said, I should have eaten the fish. <laughs> too pasty, too heavy for death on beach. Hashtag beach. too pasty, too heavy for, <laughs> for life. life. <laughs> <laughs> Pathologist Dwyer concluded, I am quite convinced the death could not have been natural. The poison I suggested was a barbiturate or a soluble hypnotic. Although poisoning was remained a prime suspicion, the pasty was not to believe to be the source of the poison. Other than that, the coroner was unable to reach a conclusion as to the man's identity or cause of death, or whether the man seen alive at Summerton Beach on the evening of November 30th was the same man that people had seen earlier. They, they, people talked about seeing a man uh, jogging, essentially a smartly dressed man jogging on the beach. <laughs> Um, Fashion was everything back then. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's like, man. It's like man number doesn't one, have a hat on. Yeah, this guy doesn't At have least. a hat. Number two, manhunt underway for man with two hats. <laughs> it's like that's the next headline, the logical conclusion. A guy a guy just runs home, sirens blaring. He, like, closes the front door, looks at his wife, and goes, burn my hats, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> January, uh, so about a month later, the staff of the Adelaide Rail Station discovered a brown suitcase with its label removed which had been checked into the, the station cloakroom the morning before the man was found. So someone's also removing labels from clothing. It's interesting. Really into it, too. In the case were a red checked dressing gown, a size 7 red felt pair of slippers, four pairs of underpants, pajamas, shaving items, a light brown pair of trousers with sand in the cuffs, an electrician screwdriver, a table knife cut down into a sharp instrument, a pair of scissors with sharpened points, a stenciling brush, used by third officers for, on merchant ships for stenciling cargo. Also in the suitcase was a thread card of Barber brand orange wax thread of an unusual type not found in Australia. It was the same type that was used to repair the lining of the pockets and the trousers that the dead man was wearing. So that's how they were able to identify that this stuff was oh, oh, yeah. stuff. Uh, all the identification marks on the clothes had been removed. The police <laughs> found the name T. Keen on a tie. Keen on a laundry bag and Keen without the last E on a signet along with three dry cleaning marks. Police believe that whoever removed the clothing tags specifically left the Keen tags on the clothing knowing that the Keen was not the dead man's name. With wartime rationing still enforced, clothing was difficult to acquire at the time. And although it was common practice to put name tags on your stuff, it was also common when buying secondhand clothing to remove the tags. Hmm. There was no T. Keen missing in any English speaking country. And a nationwide circulation of the dry cleaning marks also proved to be fruitless. Police checked train records. They speculated that the man got to the port of Augusta, showered and shaved around 10.50 a.m. Uh, then he purchased a ticket to Henley Beach for whatever reason he didn't use. He immediately checked the suitcase in at the station cloakroom before leaving the station and catching a city bus to Glenleg. Upon a re-examination, uh, John Burton Cleland noted that the man she was remarkably clean and appeared to have been polished, rather than being in a state expected of a man who had been wandering the beach of Glenlake all day. They are impressed by this dude, man. He yeah, added that really evidence. He had high calves. He was a perfect Adonis, only so dead. So sharp dressed. He added evidence that fitted in with the theory that the body might have been brought to Somerton Beach after the man's death, accounting for the lack of evidence of vomiting and convulsions, which were would be the two main effects of the p poison theory, that there's no evidence of him seizing and, pa and passing out or whatever from a poison. Well, also, uh, they they found beach sand, right, in one of, in one of his suitcases? They found sand in the cuffs sand, of so one it could of the have thing. been. They probably didn't have DNA testing to uh, find out what sand it was. Right. Yeah, I don't know what the... Uh, what the sand detection was like in the for in 1948. Cedric Stanton Hicks, a professor of physiology and pharmacology at the University of Ad Adelaide, tested that a group of drug variants that he called number one, and in particular, number two, mm. were, were extremely to toxic and relatively small oral doses, and that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to identify it if it being given to a suspect. The names were not released to the public as, at the time, they were, quote, quite easily procurable by the ordinary individual oh, damn. from a chemist without the need for a reason. Uh, the <laughs> drugs were later uh, publicly identified as Digitalis and Oabain. Oabain. O-U-A-B-A-I-N. Oabain. 
So basically, they couldn't, from investigating the body or the stuff that they found, conclude who the f*** this guy was or what killed him or how he ended up in this, like, perfectly polished position, very clean, <laughs> sitting in this, in this rock outcropping. So around the same time as they were doing the uh, reinvestigation, the, uh, they found the printed piece of paper with Tamam Shud printed on, the, on it. Uh, public library officials were called in to identify it. They say that it means ended or finished. Hmm. Well, seems found right. on the last page of the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. The other side of the paper was blank. Police conducted an Australia-wide search to find a copy of the book that had a similar uh, piece torn out. A photograph of the scrap of paper was released to the press. A man named who who ended up going by the pseudonym Ro Ronald Francis, who didn't want to be identified, uh, basically came out and said that he knew where the book was, or he had this book uh, that they removed the piece of paper from, basically. And it was like, oh well, how do we know? So they were able to actually do like microscopic check and make sure that like the tear is matched up, and it was like from the same fiber of the paper or whatever. So it was true. Was it always missing, or did he open it up one day and said, "Hey, where's my time on shoot? I don't, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know that the uh, he, he still had the book. He well, that's what I meant. But I mean, by the, the scrap was it, was, oh. was it? Did he buy the book? He was like, damn, this book has no Tam and Shoot. I don't know. And then one day, like, my Tam and has gone. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And I don't, I don't think it was, like, the last piece. It was just, like, a word in, in this book. It was ripped out. Okay. The man reached out, said he found the, the, the book that matches the thing. The cops show up. And then on the back of the book, they find uh, that there are, like, indentions from uh, somebody writing something on the back of the book. Uh, a telephone number, an unidentified number, and a text that resembled an encrypted message. So the the encryption is basically gibberish. It's uh, that's all that always works. Yeah, yeah. it's it's just, it, but it is uh, English character, I guess Latin characters, right? It is W R G O A B A D. So interestingly, uh, why the, did you pick those particular? That's ones? the top because that's at the top uh, of the of the encryption. <laughs> that's what it says. Oh, w R G O A B A B D. I thought you were just picking out random ones to say what the alphabet is. Yeah, th those are alphabets. Those are my favorite letters. The second line had been struck out, which was considered significant because then it's re repeated essentially on the fourth line. So they think that's how you can kind of that's the key is something got oh, messed yeah. up in that second line that he struck out and then had to like rewrite it. Nice. Um, so they've had several code breakers. People, code experts were called in to decipher. Everything's been unsuccessful. Uh, an unlisted telephone number was also in the back of the book, belonging to a nurse named Jessica Ellen Joe Thomas, who was born in 1921, died in 2007. Born Jesse Harkness in the Sydney suburb of Merrickville. So this all relates to actual people? Yes. She lived in uh, Mosley, Glenegg, about 400 meters north of where the body was found. So they find this book, they find a telephone number on the back of the book. Telephone number refers to a woman who lives 1,300 feet north of where the, the body was found. When she was interviewed by police, Thompson said she did not know the dead man. She said she didn't know why the dead man would have her phone number and chose to visit her on the suburb on the night of his death. However, she also reported that sometime in late 1948, an unidentified man had attempted to visit her and asked a next-door neighbor about her. In his book about the case, Gary Feltis says that he interviewed Thompson. He found that she was either being evasive or that she just didn't want to talk about it. Oh. Feltis believed Thompson knew Somerton Man's identity. Thompson's daughter, Kate, in a television interview on 60 Minutes, also said that she believed her mother knew the dead man. In 1949, Jessica Thomas requested the police not keep a permanent record of her name or release details to third, party as it would be, third parties as it would be embarrassing and harmful to her reputation to be linked. The police agreed in a decision that hampered, the police agreed a decision that hampered later investigations. They made a, a plaster cast of his face because the uh, the he was, was just so damn he was hot, so handsome, he was so hot. We had to do so keep this for posterity. Uh, when she was shown the plaster bust of the dead man by Detective Sergeant Lane, Lean Thompson, she said she could not identify the person de depicted. According to Lean, he described her reaction upon seeing the cast as completely taken aback to the point of giving the appearance that she was about to faint. Whoa! In an interview many years later, Paul Lawson, the technician who made the cast and was present when Thompson viewed it. Noted after looking at the bus, she immediately looked away and would not look back. Really? So it looked just like him? There's no way she Well, she, know. she goes in and she's like, I don't know who this is. And then they show her like, oh, is, is, you don't know who this is? And she Shot. looks away and just like won't look back. Thompson said that while she was working at the Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney during World War II, she owned a copy of the Rubaiyat, that book. Oh. In 1945, at the Clifton Gardens Hotel, she'd given it to an army lieutenant named Alf Boxel who was serving at the time in the water transport section of the Royal Australian Engineers. Thompson told police that after the war ended, uh, she moved to Melbourne and married, and she said that she had relieved a letter from Boxall, and she replied telling him that she was now married and not interested. Um, there's no evidence that Boxall had any contact with Harkness after 1945. So they're saying that maybe she made this up, the, the story of her gotcha. dealing with this guy. 
So they find this guy, Alf Boxel. He's working at a, a bus depot somewhere else in Australia. And uh, he had a copy of the book with, that she had signed and like written out really? a verse of. This is the like uh, verse that she she highlighted. Indeed, indeed, repentance oft before. I swore, but I was sober when I swore. And then, and then came spring and rose in hand. My threadbare penitence, a pieces tore. So there's piece this weird tore, tore piece. Mm-hmm. There's weird sober, right? symbolism sober, tore, and, and stuff going on. Um, there is speculation that Alf Boxel was a spy for the Australian um, intelligence or mm-hmm. the British intelligence during World War II. They, in fact, asked him during an interview, Mr. Boxel, you had been working, hadn't you, in an intelligence unit before you met this young woman, Jessica Harkness. Did you talk to her at all about that? And Boxel says no. And when asked if Harkness could have known something about it, he replies, not unless somebody told her. So he agrees that he was uh, in it, but that he hadn't told anyone about this. When Littlemore suggested the interview that there could have been espionage connected to the Somerton man, Boxel replies, that's quite a melodramatic thesis, isn't it? This is a bus depot mechanic guy who is now just for some reason hanging out in in this weird city in Australia. His copy of the book that had the page torn out, it wasn't the same one that had the page torn out, but it was his copy of this same book that this dead man has a scrap of in his pocket that they find 1,300 feet from this woman who says she doesn't know anything about any of it. So it's this uh, microcosm of strange. Right. It's it's a love triangle that the won't admit to. No offense to you know, I mean, it all just seems to point towards that, kind of, in yeah, my Yeah, kind of, but, you I know. mean... Uh, but, like, how would she... How would any of these normal people have killed any any of them with this, like, untraceable it poison? easy to find. And the one guy was deep military. He did not. Yeah, that's true. You know, that's where they know. probably teach you how to do that. You're very welcome. Case solved. So, even years after they buried the man, uh, flowers began appearing on the grave. They questioned a woman who was seen leaving the cemetery. She claimed to know nothing about him. One of the railway workers uh, came out with a, a, a story where they had seen a strange man visiting the the, the uh, Somerton man in his train car, uh, and he was English speaking and only carrying a small black case, not unlike one a musician or a doctor might carry. Interesting. This story was covered uh, several times. In fact, recently on like 60 Minutes, and they had like a little uh, mini documentary on it, um, and it's all extremely interesting. And it's difficult to go into like all the different nuance of who these people were and and what connection they end up having to the Somerton man. But uh, suffice it to say that you should look it up because again, this is, it was going to be difficult to jam it into to this amount of time, but dead guy, scrap of paper in his pocket that says ended 1300 feet from a woman's house who has her telephone number written on the back of a book that that piece of paper was removed from. Uh, so yeah, it, and and then we've got some random you know bus mechanic somewhere who has a sa- the similar copy of the book and has very you know clinical Australian salty answers for you know what what was going on during that time. Attempts to use modern DNA to identify him have kind of failed because they used formaldehyde to embalm him, so it's kind of screwed a lot of stuff up. But they were able to uh, salvage uh, hair follicles from the plaster bust that they had created uh, from like, that had been like pulled out of his skin. Yeah, his uh, um, death mask. Right. So, um, hot, hot mm-hmm. so hot. They hope that at some point, if they're able to, you know, cross-reference the DNA with someone, they can they can find out who it is. There's different reports as to who it might be. Several people have come forward and said it's oh my dad or my son or but whatever. But it's going to be a long-ranging Australian mystery. Yeah, it's definitely something that uh, is extremely uh, winding and strange. So, what's your story? I mean, does any of that? Yeah. You are listening to Fort Fritz on Real Radio 104.1. Fort Fritz on Real Radio 104.1. Welcome back to Fort Fritz. Hello, Fritz here. If you would ever like to get a hold of us or learn more about us, why don't you follow us on Facebook? That's just at Fort Fritz. We will, uh, we'll, we'll thank you later for it. This next story from yours truly. Let's get into it. The Bewitched George Lukens. If you would like more information, just download that iHeartRadio app and search Fort Fritz. Or Fort Fritz Campfire Tales to hear these individual stories. Have you guys ever heard of George Lukens? Not George Lucas. Mm-mm. George Lucas. No. Lukens. Lukens? Wait, did I Bob, research Texas. the wrong guy? No, no he's supposed to be talking about the guy that created Star Wars. Yeah, he was haunted by the ghost of... The Ewoks. Yeah, hold up. <laughs> They're making all that noise. <laughs> Let me pull and, up. And, and we Wikipedia. All, always remember, the Ewoks were going to eat them. 
Yeah, they the were. The Ewoks were going to freaking eat Spoilers. them. Spoilers. Dude, I told you that I've only been through 1.5 Star Wars movies. and I, No, no, no. I'm sorry. 2.2, 2, I guess. Two really good ones of the nine. The one, the one where he gets frozen in the uh, Carbonite. In the tinfoil, and then, Carbonite. And Planet then, Hoth. Uh, tinfoil. Hoth. The one where he pops off on the um, on the floating spaceship and where Princess Leia chokes out the slug. All spaceships space. float. <laughs> the Dune, the Dune spaceship when they're in Dune World. Uh, okay, first of all, that's a totally different story. The Dune is a totally different story. You're talking about uh, the Sarlacc pit. <laughs> okay, can I tell my story? <laughs> Does it involve spice? No. <laughs> George Lukens was a commoner in England who had a pretty strange trip. He um, the story dates back to the 18th century on a Saturday in May 1778. The Honorable Anglican Vicar of Temple Church, Reverend Joseph Easterbrook, had his first encounter with George Lukens after a traveler named Sarah Barber told him something was super f***. Oh, and uh, okay. So <laughs> this is how these two met. Okay. All right. Vicars probably hear some super f*** from time to time. Right? Probably. Like, you're the vicar. <laughs> the vicar's like, well, you know, God loves all of his children, but how f*** are we talking about? <laughs> <Well, laughs> Uh, purely for the sake of comedic transparency, we will now refer to the vicar as Joey. Joey right. the vicar. Okay. George Lukens is now going to be Georgie Boy. Georgie right. Boy. And Sarah Barber will be thusly referred to as the footnote in history only afforded to the types of women who truly call for Aww. challenging about face the metaphysical challenges of religion, ideology, ultimately bringing into the new world a vastly different point of view. Traveling lady. Oh. The traveling Damn, you got lady. Deep on that one. Yeah. Yeah. This is Joey. Is it Sarah with an H? Yeah. Okay. With Georgie uh, Boy. Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> traveling lady approaches Joey and says he should really check on old Georgie Boy. Quote, he's in a bad way, barking like a dog, as it were. Unquote. I made that up. I don't know if that's quoted. <laughs> that's probably Sorry. how it went down. As it were sounds like the way they would put yeah. that. Yeah. So I believe it. You know, he's a common carrier. Uh, by the way, do you know what a common carrier is? Do not. Uh, like when it comes to a disease? or Well, yeah, that would be, uh, what's it called, infection by vector, like a mosquito. Right. Is um, it an airline ticket you get? A common a carrier? carrier ticket on an airline. Yeah. yeah. I thought all of those things, too. But sure. literally, it just it's a blue-collared worker back then. So oh, like a carrier. smithy, whatever, common carrier. Like a dude you could <laughs> yell at if you were a nobleman. <laughs> literally, yeah. Kaz just n- nail it. Common. Yeah. If you just had a bad day, you could just take Get it out, out on them. Yeah. yeah. Here's some right. meat or whatever. So it's a retail worker. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah exactly. Someone you could just take out all your frustrations. Yes. So all are, there, jeans. are there people that just do that? <laughs> yeah. There's people that just like, man, I'm just going to go to a retail store and just rip on someone's I ass. need to Probably. speak to someone's manager. That's the, like the, uh, the whatever. You get the haircut and you go. Yep. Can I speak to your boss haircut? So, traveling lady say black magic curse, Georgie boy, quote, in which he sang and screamed in various sounds, some of which did not resemble a human voice, and declared doctors could do him no service, unquote. That is an actual quote. Oh. Uh, but traveling, traveling lady say Georgie boy, for nearly two decades, had been acting off his rocker, a rocker having been invented the Wednesday previous. <laughs> Joey, you had fun writing this. Didn't you? Technology oh is still unproven. A little wobbly, might have thrown nice. it. Trendy. Now stick with me here. Joey said the lady say Georgie boy has been acting crazier and crazier ever since God <laughs> smacked his silly ass during a Christmas pageant. And that's an actual <laughs> what? That's, that's an actual quote. An actual smacked his silly <laughs> ass was silly <laughs> ass in the quote. <laughs> No, but that's an actual thing that happens in this story. He said he was doing a pageant. I can only imagine. You're a grand old flag. You're a, and then he just felt a... And said, oh, man. God smacked him. Theater during, people are really, really critical. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Caught like a funky look from the crowd. And he was just like, I'm Dan. He gets up. God, a grand me. old flag. Do he gets the hook work? and just gets pulled <laughs> yeah. off stage. So guess what happens? They lock Georgie Boy up. 20 weeks go by. He's pronounced incurable by a surgeon for uh, whatever the f*** reason. No records indicate the surgeon, a Dr. Smith, Ooh. did any operating. But since this was the 18th century, who cares? The medical community said he was bewitched. Worth noting, first written evidence of the word schizophrenia is still over 100 years off. Oh, damn. Which is most likely the explainable demon in all of this, but exacerbating the sitch. Georgie Boy says seven demons inside him. 
would gladly f*** up at least seven clergymen. Oh. Joey gets the help of Reverend John Volton, asking if the good reverend would, quote, agree to pray for Georgie boy, unquote. And again, I made that one up. Volton, quote, cried out before God, Lord, I am not fit for such a work, unquote. That's real. Volton later... See, he cucked out and made a Reverend John he Wesley pray for Georgie Boy instead. <laughs> this guy had one job. They said, can you pray for one dude? And he said, oh, I don't know if I can. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bark him like a dog. Uh, I don't know He's if I can. Wow. So he had a Reverend John Wesley pray for Georgie Boy. The good Reverend John Wesley will henceforth be known as Johnny. The exorcism recounted in the Bristol Gazette said Georgie Boy claimed he was the devil and did a lot of other things that could totally never be source cited. Like somehow, someone in the presence of the event duly noted Georgie Boy, inverted an entire verse from a 4th century hymnal, and sang it. Like backwards. Backwards. Oh. How like, well now, phonically backwards or just word for word backwards? Ooh. Again. And also, you got to be well versed in that this thing that he was claiming to know that this man spit backwards because I, I don't know that even my like favorite songs, if they were repeated backwards to me, that I would be able to pick them out. Yeah. No, because you have a trivia bit about just saying lyrics and they don't make sense. Yeah, if you, if you just if you take a lyric that you've heard before and just if you say it in a different pattern or rhythm, it'll just completely lose it. Just insane stuff. And also would do normal stuff like just act violent. Violently, that these people were Just trying to like acting violent to trying to take seven souls out of this corpse, you know, co just corpse waiting to happen, pretty much. Pre corpse. So, Johnny <laughs> and Joey, all? nicely done. Johnny and Joey, again, they are the uh, reverends. Casted the seven demons out of Georgie Boy alone. Well, you know, the two of them because. <laughs> this is what I wrote. Oh, God. You're amusing the hell of yourself, and I love it. Apparently by reciting basic religious stuff. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Perfect. Do other priests, like, front up at other priests when they're like, I, I got the deep, you know? I mean. I don't know. <laughs> Do you just, like, drop a Bible and walk out? Like, yeah. Just, like... <laughs> Johnny had something to say after the ceremonial debriding of the spirit. He said the account would... Uh, be indebted to the modern era of skepticism, but then pointed to the scriptures and, quote, other authentic history, unquote, to further back what he, Johnny, would say was completely objectively and not subjectively, mind you, classic evidence of a demonic possession. At the time, a noted demonologist, a Dr. Ferriar. I want to be a demonologist. Criticized the, case. Yeah, so right? yeah. criticized the case. He didn't feel as though Georgie Boy really suffered from a demonical episode, but rather maybe epilepsy or mental illness were to blame. Again, schizophrenia is 100 years off from even being diagnosed. Dr. Ferriar goes so far as to call him an imposter masquerading as a demoniac. Demoniac. Ooh, demoniac. We open for those guys in Tampa. They're really cool. <laughs> yes. You know, You'd love of, every band. You, you know, I was going to say, he's <laughs> never played with a band he doesn't like. Are you kidding? I, no, I can, I, oh, no, I can tell you plenty of bands Consonant I play with that I don't like. Pro. I played with the Bubble uh, uh, Balloon Boys band, okay? They Is that real? Yes. Yes, the kid Jesus. that was in the balloon that everybody watched on uh, on the network news. They thought he was in the balloon. He was just hiding up in the attic. Oh. Yeah, he had a band and they opened for us and they sucked. And they were so. called the Balloon Boys. No, I can't band? remember. I can't remember their <laughs> names. Oh God! Just really just really on the nose. Yeah, yeah. Really leaning on that. And I, we didn't even know we were they were opening for us until we got to the gig. We go to the gig. I'm looking at the flyer. I'm looking at the flyer. I'm like, Are you the that balloon freaking boy? Freaking balloon boy, dude. How would you know? How did you wow. recognize Face him? Thing. Because yeah. they played at a local club here, um, like. A month previous that I just happened to what be. What was uh, that from? I want to make a fall from grace reference, but in open it up for Gargamel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the lowest of the low. Man, there's nowhere to go from there. Where do they live? Like, where was Bubble Boy? Uh, Balloon, Boy. Balloon Boy. Balloon Boy. Uh, Balloon Boy. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere Midwest. Or I, probably, I keep yeah. thinking Bubble Boy. I think Bubble Boy. Yeah, too. Balloon yeah. Boy. Where, where Bubble Boy they? is a sad story of a man with an immune disorder. Yeah. yeah. John Travolta did a movie. About yeah. Yes, he did. I thought it was yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal. He did it too. And here we are. And that was your bubble minute. And here we are. Georgia boy never ever did anything stupid forever after. Okay? And the world is still skeptical of actual fact-based news to this day. So thank you so much, traveling lady, for everything. So just, just from her account of what we've learned about... Seven demons being, uh, that was, is that like, like one of the first 
I don't know. I just I think I think it's so funny how this person, Sarah Barber, said, "Hey, I don't know. Check on this guy." And then he was just f- tortured. It's like it, it it goes into those religious stories of, "Well, I don't know, but she's a b- Let's kill her. Yeah. They always go and yeah. blame the woman. Yeah. Clearly perform some black magic on him. No, I think the uh, the the real funny part to me on this is the fact that the medical community, quote unquote, diagnosed him. So somewhere on a piece of paper was written, bewitched. Yeah, and yeah, also, that's true. A surgeon. That's tight as f- exactly. A surgeon. Like a surgeon yeah. whose whose job is to go into the skin and look at things and like barber. I can't fix them. You know what? I don't know what it was. Demons. Demons. Yeah, demons. demons. <laughs> yeah. I wanted you to do some him. cocaine about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. Up next, Bungalow and the Bus. Good night. Be safe. Stay spooky. Until next time. Pleasant dreams.